Warning, while this video does not contain graphic descriptions, it does contain a frank discussion of childhood sexual abuse within a high control group, recounting the experiences of survivors in their own words. If this is likely to be too disturbing for you, feel free to skip this one. If you have experienced sexual abuse or are experiencing suicidal ideation and need help, we have put several helpful links in the description. Hi, I'm okay. John Atak, as usual, and this is Anka Richter, who is the author of a fantastic new book called Cult Trip. Hi, Anka. Hi, John. Thank you so much. And we're talking from other ends of the world today. So uh, I'm in England and you're in New Zealand, I think. That's right. Yeah, a long time away. But I guess it's a global topic, isn't it? Absolutely. It's something that affects everybody's lives. And I, I think so many people don't realize, but everybody knows at least one person who is mired into an authoritarian cult group, um, often more. So yeah, it's it's a very relevant topic. And and it's good that in the last few years, it's been seen to be more relevant than, than it used to be. I've been, it's, it'll be 40 years this year since uh, I started talking openly about, uh, firstly about Scientology and then other groups. So uh, I have seen changes in the world and there's a bit more public interest now. She's good. You've, you've certainly been an early adapter, and also I think there's been a lot of change, not just with the cult reckoning and the Me Too movement arriving in the spiritual board, but also I think cult journalism has changed, and also the um, the cult activism has changed through social media as well. So, I mean, you're you're one of the pioneers of of so yeah of, of of this movement, and it's definitely grown, and it's really good to see, and we can we can all learn so much from people like you. Thank you. Um, so what was it that, that started you on, on the journey? I mean, you're a professional journalist, you're a professional writer, you've, you've had work published all over the world in significant, um, media, uh, outlets. What, what was it that started you on, on the journey towards culture? But we should perhaps say that, that this is largely a book about sex. This is a book about groups who are abusing sex, um, you know, and, Take yeah, it, more, using it to control people. I think it's more correct to say it's also it's more a book about sexual abuse. Yes, absolutely. Sex. Yes, I, I mean right. it's not the Kama Sutra. Let's just make that clear. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a book that you you read, you know, to to stimulate yourself unless unless you you you're really wired in a really worrying way. Um, I mean, you, you never know, right? But it's 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 quite a, it's a book that comes with a trigger warning, and it's quite full on. Mm. And I've heard from a lot of my friends here also in New Zealand who've, who've read it and people have read it that they need to put it down after, you know, I know exactly after which chapter they contact me and write to me and say, I had to put it down, mm. I needed a break, and then they can get back into it. And then it gets a bit easier. But yeah, there's some really, really full on stuff in there. So to jump right in, it all kicked off for me um, with Centerpoint, which um, we can talk a bit more in detail later, but it, it was just to give, give you know, your international orders a bit of a framing. It was a um, a sex and therapy cult from the 1980s from the human potential movement it was actually the New Zealand appendix of the human potential movement and um, they operated for um, around 20 years out of New Zealand until it was shut down and raided by police I mean first there were the police raids people went to jail shut down much later when people took um, you know court cases to actually shut them down financially the trust Anyway, I had I had never really heard of Centerpoint because I didn't grow up in New Zealand and all this was before the internet, so it didn't really mean anything to me. But there was a similar group with very similar philosophy, which you might be familiar with, the Ottomur Commune um, at Free Resort in Austria, very um, infamous also for its promiscuity and maybe a bit more radical and at least in its look, its shaved heads and overalls and a you know, a sex roster every night, uh, who should be with whom. They were they were operating at the same time, but maybe that gives, you know, gives gives, gives listeners a bit of a, a framework of what Centre One was. So I went to a, don't cringe, don't laugh, I went to a New Age festival um, in 2012. Um, I was going to write about it, but I was also curious for my own reasons at that time, being a middle-aged woman with a lovely life and but also missing some things and always sort of on the hunt for intensity and finding maybe New Zealand also 
small and I wouldn't say boring, but I, I guess I was at, you know, it was the perfect time for me where something could land that I hadn't really um, acknowledged until then or wasn't really aware that I was actually missing it. So I went to this neo tantra festival called Taste of Love in Australia, in Byron Bay, which is very much the hippie new age mecca of Australia. And um, not only did something land there for me where I thought, wow, this is not actually as weird and as I thought, you know, there's something in here for me that, that I'm curious about that I want to know more about. And I had a, like an ecstatic awakening there actually after a session of ecstatic dance. And so there was a real shift. And then um, coincidentally, while I sort of was gliding into my own cultic spiritual journey, I, I also fell, you know, I also became an accidental um, sex cult tourist or slash, you know, journalist who was investigating these groups because I met a woman um, then in her 40s, Angie Mickeljohn, who had been a teenager at Centerpoint. And I hadn't really heard about it. And she straight away framed it as a sex cult, former sex cult. Mm -hmm. and wow, what? Here in New Zealand? What was that? Because I was familiar with Scientology. I was familiar with the Ottomir commune. I've always had an interest in, in high demand groups, more from a distance though. And um, then I thought, wow, how come no one in New Zealand has really looked into this? Because she, Angie told me that she'd been the commune concubine there. So I thought, wow, that's a really interesting and conflicting and possibly awful story. And it was awful because hers it was a story of, of drug rape by the guru and being groomed, then later falling into alcoholism, prostitution, losing custody of her kids. And I mean, it's like a very typical story for so many of the former kids and teenagers from Centerpoint. Long story short, I thought I could write the book. I've written some books in German before. Um, I, I had a publisher here in New Zealand, actually Australia, who was really interested in that. And I went off and I thought, okay, I'll just write Angie's story down and maybe find a few more people and it's a book. And um, what I didn't realize is that I, that, that I stepped into this massive cesspool, mm. this, this sort of hornet, you know, like a hornet's nest of, of so much unresolved trauma, of, um, of, of, of so many people's lives that were entangled at the time and there were some were really ready to talk about it 20 years later, others weren't. So this is how I get, got into cult journalism because I actually had to write a book, which I then gave up two years later. It became too overwhelming, too taxing. Mm -hmm. There were lots and lots of legal issues. Um, I was having the carious, I was later di diagnosed with the carious trauma, mm -hmm. taking on all these pretty horrific stories and also getting really close to some of the survivors and you you know who they are and we can talk about you know some of them later and um so when i stopped that I, st I still wrote the making of of the book for um a large magazine here in new zealand for north and south and even though it felt like a total failure to me because it was just the tip of the iceberg that i could publish mm -hmm. in you know five thousand words compared to a whole book it still set a lot of things in motion, like the Centerpoint Restoration Project. You know, when, when people came out of the woodwork and found that the story had helped them or made them more empowered to speak about it and two, documentary, two documentaries came out of it and so on. By then I was pretty attuned to Celtic dynamics, at least in other groups, not so much maybe in the scene that I was in at the time still, um, but that happened later. So yeah, I, and then I, I, I just started investigating more more cults and I think the big turnaround for me also was because then it became so close to home when the Agama drama happened in Thailand mm. which is you know the, the second big part of my book Toxic yes. Tantra and all of a sudden that was really close to home like wow this, these are these are people I could potentially know or these are people mm. who sort of move, move in the same you know yoga scene or tantra scene and so it became it, yeah, this, this, and I said, and then I went to um, Akama, but I'm going to tell you more about that later. So basically, and then Glory Vell and a, a few other groups as well that I've checked out on the way, but you're right, most of them could, could be labeled, could be labeled as a sex cult, even though they all look very different. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to read us something um, about from the center point section, perhaps, of your book? Yeah, it's great. I've never read on a on a podcast. I love, I love doing that. It reminds me of my, you know, my former days, my other books when I did readings as an author. So it's yeah. Mm. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. I'm putting my glasses on here. Excellent. Ah, so um, just to give give some context. So one of the probably most severely abused 
victims of center point was Louise, Louise Wynn, and she was in her 40s, late 40s when I met her. I'd almost given up my research by then because I come to a dead end, the people closed the doors on me. And I've, I've, you know, and even often even some of the people I thought they might be, they would be so happy to hear from me, like a former whistleblower or one victim, one survivor who'd gone public in the 1990s. But then they were actually, off, the, some of them were the most litigious people against me because I triggered their PTSD or they were, they felt that they had no control about what I would write. And maybe they've had some bad experience with media before. They didn't want to be exposed or some of the nicest, friendliest, most seemingly cooperative people were the abusers, for instance, mm -hmm. also the sexual abuser of this woman I'm going to talk about soon. So then I heard about the girl in the caravan. So at center point where people all lived communally, um, this girl, Louise, she, when she was 10, 11, she was pretty much like most kids, they abandoned by their parents. Kids were left to their own. Parents were in the workshops, open up their relationships, busy with their personal growth. And, um, and the philosophy at the time was very much that children should be freed sexually. And this wasn't just a center point thing. There were some quite, some real outliers in psychology at, at the time, you know, even academics who, who propagated that it's, mm -hmm. it's actually healthy, if inter, intergenerational sex, as they called it, is not the problem. It's what happens in society later when the children are told this is bad for them and the social workers also interfere. Very much what Centerpoint was um, propagating as well and their guru. And, um, and, and Bert Potter to... was sort of pretending to be a therapist and, and retired. He was a self-acclaimed therapist yeah. and he'd come up with this... Um, technique that they call blowing off at center point which was supposed to give women you know more better orgasms and open them up and i mean don't forget this is the 1980s and early 1980s and and new zealand was a real was a real backwater back then especially when it came to therapy and social movements and so on so back then if you wanted some kind of counseling especially around your sexuality there was the gynecologist or was the or there was the church so when Bert Potter arrived on the scene, he'd gone to Esalen in California and to Osho's ashram, or then Bhagwan or Sri Rajesh um, ashram in India, where he probably, you know, learned where he, where he was shown the ropes of, you know, how to how to how to be a guru and start a community and also have, you know, get laid a lot or <laughs> so to be crass. But he, you know, he must have sort of, yeah, he he brought back this whole package of human potential movement meets cartic dynamics mm. and 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 offered that in New Zealand and lots of people flocked him and even social services sent clients and patients to him mm. therapists in in Auckland here and they went to his workshops he, he was a, he was a big deal at the time mm. and all the rumors about our kids safe there they started later but then they were always just treated as gossip and rumors and so long sad story short louise arrived there with her parents and um she was only there for a few months and her sexual abuse started she was brought to Bert potter by his wife margie who and this was a common thing at at center point as in other cults as well where the women are the go-betweens or they sort of normalize the what the dodgy guru stands for and the women soften that and they build the trust and mm -hmm. they almost become you know, pimps, and that's what, at least according to Lee, is what Margie was. And um, she later then moved into a caravan by herself at the age of 11 or so on the on the property at Center Point, and she barricaded herself with junk in there, so that if if men came to her at night, and because it wasn't just Bert Potter, other men, you know, she was prey for a lot of men there, and she would have just sort of junk in her caravan that she would hear if someone's entered the caravan, and they would fall over something she would hear it and she would escape to the window she was hiding in the bushes she was hiding in the little habit rabbit hutches it's an absolutely heartbreaking story which I learned from her over hours and hours and it was the very first time that she's even talked about it she's never told anyone her story which, which for me was just unfathomable even though she's taken her abusers to court the police you know she wrote everything down for the police she she once tried to see a therapist and then she she told me that the therapist or the receptionist in this women's health center women's refuge kind of you know women's center that the receptionist threw up when louise mentioned what had happened to her 
So I was the first person to learn the everything. And so I'm going to read you a little bit about the end of our interview when we all when we went and had something to eat yeah. after talking for hours. She orders a glass of Riesling and we relax. She laughs. Her face starts to change. It might be the effect of the wine, but under the faded pale exterior, another woman emerges with a youthful glow. <clears throat> it's like a moment of shape-shifting, a glimpse into the person she could have been, comfortable in her own skin. If she hadn't been abandoned in a caravan where she was open prey for men who merely destroyed her. Were you involved with any of the boys at Central Point? I ask. Oh, no, no, God, no. She puts a fork aside. There was no way, no, I couldn't be looked at. I don't quite understand. She repeats. I couldn't have someone look in my face. The abuser who fingered her prepubescent body after the massage and the pottery had said to her right afterwards, your face has a funny expression when you're receiving pleasure. It has messed her up ever since. He was the most damaging, she says. It's just her knuckles on the wine glass go almost white. There's no way to describe how that has affected me. Lights out, no one can see me. All her relationships end because she won't show her face. She can't look at herself in the mirror or have her photo taken. Even when she is alone in the house, she locks the bathroom door. I just lived like a statue, like having a lobster shell around me, not showing any pleasure or anything. She always avoided sex, no boyfriend understood. She was married once, it only lasted a year. That's about how long it would take someone to be sick of me. If she could be with a 90 year old man who was totally impotent, it would be perfect. She half smiles at me now. I got cats instead. And when it gets too much, she smiles again. I hug a tree, I'm not kidding. Yeah. That's her story. And um, a, a, an incredible woman, Her meeting her, changed my life and because at that at that point like I told you before I'd come to a bit of a dead end and I was almost thinking mm, I'm just I know I haven't got everything I haven't got all the really big stories here but some people are talking to me doors have closed and then wow this falls you know this falls into my lap you know, journalistically it was a breakthrough but emotionally it's almost like it set me on a on a crusade I, I lost my I, w I was so affected and, and so empathic and I just couldn't believe how many adults from Center Point I talked to from my parents and enablers and deniers, all the nice, good people of Center Point, who I thought, wow, they, they do not know this. Mm. They should. They need to know this. Mm. How, how can they not get it now? Because I know, and I've I've only been talking to people. I've never even lived there. I've only been talking to people for a few months or a year or so. But they were there. They lived there, and and they've been living with it ever since for twenty years. And they've been moved in the same circles. And so I was on this crusade to open people's eyes and basically, you know, knock knock at their doors and go, you need it. You need to see this. Yeah. And it's it became so complicated. One of my first um, supporters was a um, um, supporter, yeah. I mean, he's written, he's, he was the former historian of Center Point and he's written a book about Center Point, but that was back before the shit hit the fan. It was pretty much a work of PR for the cult. Mm -hmm. um, but he was also quite helpful in helping to open doors for me and if I would be open-minded enough and all of that. And then at some point I learned something about him which which put him in a very different light. And, you know, how to, how to reconcile um, how to reconcile all that? So Louise was a turning point for me, and and I'm just um, I'm just I'm, I'm really happy to share that she's actually seeing a therapist now finally, and that she's still around and still alive. And because a lot of children from Center Point have ended up either suicidal or uh, in drugs, you know, sex work, um, addiction of some sort. A new university here in New Zealand did a study in 2010. Um, it was called another kind um oh sorry another kind of family 
um, different kind of family. You can look it up. Anyone can read it online. Okay. And they found out that every third child at center point would have been likely sexually abused. So it is a massive scandal. And it's also something I think that we, we can learn from. But New Zealand seems not to have learned from it enough because, as you know, the last part of my book is, is Gloria Bell, a Christian cult, where some of the same things have just repeated themselves. Yeah. yeah. And that's that was, again, another motivation for me to, to write this book. It's like, have we learned nothing from center point? It's bad enough that that happened. But you could say, OK, back in the 80s, people didn't quite have the same understanding of child, you know, sexual child abuse and the signs to look for. And there were these warped ideologies around um, free love that you know encompassed some, some really worrisome philosophies when it came came to, to children. Right. And, and consent and boundaries and all these things. But now, how come, you know, in, in a country like New Zealand that is so egalitarian and, and is actually quite woke on many, many levels, mm. um, this, can, this can still stay under the radar. But yeah, I'm on a rant now, John, sorry. <laughs> rant away, that's absolutely fine. And with, with such um, emotionally disturbing material, it's inevitable that, that one becomes passionate. Uh, if one has a heart and you know I too it it shocked me seeing the way that people will reframe the past to justify themselves to make themselves right and you know my perception is that such people need to face what they actually did they need to take responsibility for what they did because it will stunt them on a daily basis until they do but I think when somebody has been involved in such massive abuse, you know, we're talking here about an 11 year old girl with nobody to protect her, no parent, no caregiver to protect her, having to devise some strategy of avoidance. And that's all she had. How do I keep out of the way? How do I stop these people raping me, attacking me, assaulting me? And, the, you know, the justification, and I think you, you know, you describe it very well indeed i think do come away with an understanding from from what you've written that, that these people have just dissociated themselves from from what they really did it's, it, there's a there's a documentary um about the killings in east timor where they come back years later and talk to the men who did it and they're sitting and laughing among themselves and smoking cigarettes and talking about how many people they they murdered and the, the strange places that, that the human mind can go to, the, the justification. I think, I think it's, it's good that you bring up, you know, is, is Timor or those politically motivated or, or religiously motivated massacres? Because, you know, for me, growing up in Germany and always carrying the, you know, the, the collective shame of what happened um, in my country and also coming to terms with, you know, this, these are my, this is the generation of my, my, my grandparents and, and how much were they complicit and what role did they play in this whole term of, there's a German word midläufer, which, which is a really, um, it, it, it stands for something really bad. It's the person who just runs along with, yeah? Mm. And it's, it, it means that you, it basically means enabler, yeah? Or bystander, mm. a, bit, a bit of both, yeah? It's definitely a bit of both. And center points really, it's almost like, a, I guess, most cultic groups are like little microcosms of these form of, of these of these dictatorships. And it's not just about the dictator. It's for me, it was never so much about Bert Potter. He, he was the obvious charismatic guru with you know his self acclaimed um, qualifications and 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 the sexual pull he had, even though he didn't really look the part, but he must have had some kind of gift. And that was he wasn't really a mystery to me. <laughs> he was like almost like a cookie cutter cult leader. But what about all these normal people who who founded the community? Because they were doctors and lawyers and school teachers, and they were not some you know lost souls. I mean, of course, you, you we, we know that it's not necessarily lost, lost souls that end up in cults. You know, this this whole cliche of typical cult followers doesn't doesn't it's just not correct. And so for me, it was always a question. How did how did all these people who who went in there with best intentions or certainly did not expect or want their children to be sexually abused there? How did they end up in these roles of enablers or bystanders or turning a blind eye? And then also later, and this is also again relevant to what you said with East Timor or what I've what I've you know I've been sitting on with 
post-war Germany, what are, where are people now? How do they look back? Have they gone through a process of accountability, of, re of redemption, of, of acknowledgement, of somehow trying to do their bit because they they were a little cog in you know in the you know or they they played their part in this animal farm or in this system in the totalitarian system. So what are they doing now after the downfall? Are they are they doing their part to help the survivors or are they just looking away and and it's I mean I you know I don't want to be too judgmental because I personally don't know how I would have been what role I would have played in any kind of system. So it's it's easy to always assume oh I would have been the the truth speaker or the whistleblower or I would have joined the White so Rose Society and died. The White yeah. Rose. I would have been so, who doesn't want to think of themselves that they would have been so sure. But I grew up with this when I when I grew up grew up in, in, in Germany and first learned about the, the nasty regime and I was I was twelve and I think it must have been had some in, impact, possibly some kind of traumatic impact on my whole being and thinking and coming to terms with it this 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 is this is the world you know around me has that has has let that happen of course i, I identified straight away with oh but there was sophie sean and i would have been i wouldn't have been that person and we just don't know we don't know right no sir but for so, the grace so i so i don't want to I mean, there's some unforgivable things. Don't don't get me wrong, especially in Centre Court. You know, there were there were some really awful predators mm -hmm. who, under this disguise of of sexual freedom and growth, you know, they ran with it and and got their sexual gratification in the most disgusting, horrible way. And there were also a lot of people who did something, you know, that is criminal, like for instance, um, mothers um, engaging sexually with their teenage sons, for instance, or even younger, and um, where where that was a task from Bert, from Bert Potter. And I'm not trying to make excuses just for the mother. There were also transgressive women who abused mm -hmm. children at center point. And it's such a murky, you know, the roles, it's not so black and white. That's really what I learned through through this whole mm -hmm. research. And I think that's also what um, got me deeper and deeper into cult journalism was the finding those nuances of, of, of how these systems work and the roles people play and then you know as as you know from reading the book i found quite a few people also who were involved in sexual abuse who were perpetrators and predators and who spoke to me about that and some of that was pretty shocking right getting a glimpse into an, a sexual abuser's mind like louise's abuser john potter who was the, who's the son uh, of the guru and who didn't seem to have learned that much all these years later who actually couldn't even remember what happened with her. This is how maybe casual it was for him. I don't know. And But I also met someone, you know, I, I, I spoke to other men from other cults as well who'd been accused of, of being sexually transgressive. And it's really interesting to see the different stages of acknowledgement and that there are better ways and not so great ways to come to terms with what you've done. Hmm. So I, I also hope that cult trip is giving a bit of a maybe a, a roadmap or, or at least you know opens the door a bit to that discussion as well but I am giving the survivors a voice but I'm also giving people a voice who've done things wrong in cults and maybe that's 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 a bit of a new approach but I think it's really important to do that because only then we can learn from that and also we can see maybe the parts of us that could have done these things and not go oh no I would have I would have never been that person in a cult. I would have never done that. Well, you actually don't know. You know, if you come under under influence, under under a certain level of control, you just don't know. So let's understand these dynamics and nip them in the bud, right? Mm. And I think look, looking at the Nazis and and that insanity that spread through the German-speaking world, um, the pan-Germanic movement, the Aryan movement, and looking back at it, it look it seems so foreign so strange so other to the way that we live now but it isn't and we live on the edge of it watching the the populist movements rising say in hungary and austria the trump followers QAnon, coming out of that we are so close to you know we're looking at what putin is is doing or, or, or xi in in china or you know what bolsonaro did and it Duterte and onto we've got a Marcos in the Philippines again, so it 
it's and and when you look at the the history of of Germany and how this happened, um, looking at the you know say the the movie Come and See about what happened to the Belarusian population when the Einsatzgruppen went through, and that there was tremendous participation there and in the Ukraine. Let's add this in as well. There was tremendous participation in the extermination programs, so that. Jews, Romanis, um, blacks, communists, journalists, certain, you know, demographics were to be destroyed. And I remember there's a documentary series called The Nazis, A Warning from History, which I watched a couple of times over the years. And there's a point where a man is saying, well, the Jews were our neighbors. And so that they're not in a German speaking country. They're in a Slavic country. They've been invaded by by German troops. And he said, well, you know, when harvest time came, we would go to their fields and help them. They would come to our fields and help us. When we had celebrations, we would celebrate together. And then the Einsatzgruppen came and we killed all of our neighbors. You know, so at the drop of a hat almost. And so I, I think it is very important to question these things. I think, you know, if we look at Germany's response, Adenauer, gives a huge amount of money to Israel to establish what is pretty much an apartheid state to where people feel, and, and certainly not all Israelis, a number of my closest friends um, are Israelis, um, and they are people who protest against um, Netanyahu and the, and the Likud and the, the, the kind of the hard right. But you have these attitudes of mind where it was all right for Germans to consider Jews second-class citizens, lice-infested, disease-ridden. And we have the same sort of attitude in Israel towards Palestinians and see that, of course, high school children in Israel will be taken to, to see Auschwitz, the, the reconstructed Auschwitz, and put through a traumatic experience and be told um, by their teachers, if you're Jewish, people want to kill you. This is part of the lesson that's taught in schools. Now, I take Israel as one example. I, I could probably find 70 or 80 yep. countries where the same kind of, yep. you know, certainly in Saudi Arabia, the, the educational system is, is not really teaching people to be tolerant um, and to, to behave in a, in a moral way. So these questions are absolutely urgent in our society that, that we have to understand and tolerate differences of opinion but but we should not tolerate the abuse of we shouldn't tolerate abuse full stop but we most certainly shouldn't tolerate the abuse of children which happened on on such a remarkable scale at, at center point you mentioned mentioned essel and of course you had this the human potential movement in the early 60s in california you had essel where you know, aldous huxley would go there alex comfort who wrote The Joy of Sex, went to live there because he was a very small man who couldn't get girlfriends, and he was famous now. And there are all these stories of, of orgies among intellectuals at, at this place who don't seem to have any real understanding of the, the kind of group they are creating. And that spread out and, of course, was pushed further by people like Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary out of Harvard who, who gave you LSD and told you to... Yeah. have sex with everybody. I, did, did you know that I actually went to Esalen um, last year and I wrote a, a big feature for a New Zealand magazine about it. And it was really interesting because of the history with Bill Potter and um, I mean, things were really loose there in, in those days. And there was a lot of a lot of carnage and a lot of misogyny and of, also a lot of exploration. exploration. And um, I I, I didn't come back with a with a bad feeling from from Esalen. I think they've, they've really learned, you know, from from their past and that's sort of the fine it's a fine line to walk for me as well and I think that's kind of what I what I stand for also is that we we don't have to give up on sexual exploration or on living in communities or on spiritual growth or you know it's it's not about that but let's please learn from the mistakes from from the past and and like what you said before you know the big sort of over layer of um horrific you know, of, of, of political atrocities on a, on a grand scale and how they're almost 
how, how a little system like center point reflects that where people also did something that is you know now in, in pretty much everyone's understanding across you know across all cultures is is horrific namely the sexual abuse of children but it can become even those things can become normalized if you live in a closed up environment and you have the right if there's enough manipulation and fervor and follow the leader and shutting down your own instincts and your own moral compass, then that is actually possible by people who were not pedophiles to begin with. This wasn't set up as a commune for pedophilia. Do you know? I mean, I'm sure those places probably exist as well, but that wasn't the, you know, it, it kind of came with the territory. And that's what's so shocking and so alarming for me. Um, I mean, you could you could argue with the, with the Nazis that the extermination of Jews was always part of the program. But I think if if the Nazis had you know when they when they first came to power, if they had put that out straight away and said, oh, and by the way, you know, in a few years we're going to build concentration camps and 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 then, then you know six six million people, you know, six million dead people later, you know, this is what we. I don't think that would have worked. I don't think they would have gotten the the. The wider public behind them, right? Mm. And 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 parents would have sent their children to the Hitler Youth and stuff. You know, it's that gradual, the succession of starting with something that's seemingly good and reformative or offers a solution to whatever, and then you know, piece by piece, the the bad stuff creeps in. And mm. yeah, so that's those parallels. I think are justified. I think so. It, it... In the, and the kind of... just, just to add this, I didn't put it in the book because she thought it was too strong, but Louise said, that the, I think one of the very last things she said to me was, center point was like Auschwitz for me. That's what she said. And then I changed it in the book to, it was, that she said it was like a prison camp for me because she felt it was maybe disrespectful to Jewish survivors, to Holocaust survivors, mm. bless her. Um, and at the same time, I want to acknowledge that's what this felt like for her. Like she was in a a, a death camp. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 what you say is true. There are increments of dissonance. You know, with Hitler, it happened very rapidly. Of course, you know, the Reichstag fire, fire gave him power within a couple of months that that the people who put him there had never expected him to take, and the camps start to be built just a year after he comes to power in 1934. Um, but their work camps, they're to reform people, they're to, you know, like the Chinese re-education camps, they're, they're going to make people better and make them good members of society. And of course, the final solution, the Wannsee Conference in what 1942, where suddenly all of the machinery of the state is being aimed at destroying these populations, the Jews and the Romanis. And the, the Romanis are so infrequently mentioned at this point, and it is so we're, important. We're on a historical tangent now. Should we jump to the other cults in the book as well? I, I think we probably Let's should do. do. Yeah. Um, let, let me just make another point, though. Having criticised Israel, let, let me also mm -hmm. talk about institutionalised sexual abuse in Arab countries, where you have muti marriage where a girl as young as eight years old can be given in marriage for a single day to somebody. And as long as that person does not have penetrative sex with her, can do whatever he likes. If he does have penetrative sex with her, she won't be allowed to marry again. And you've got this, I'm sorry, what did you just say? And this is happening throughout that part of the world. So I think looking to the rights of children particularly, that if you want to change a society, I think one of the most significant changes that's happened in society is that, that it is no longer considered normal to beat children. And I yeah. think in terms of the trauma that's passed on, man passes misery on to man, the trauma that's passed on, that, that we can improve society and we are improving society simply because that attitude of brutality towards children or the idea that children are somehow a possession you know, that, that that giving the same rights to children that adults have is, is a very important... This is, why I feel so, this is why I feel so passionate about children and cults, and this is why, mm. you know, some... But I would say the majority of the survivors' voices in my book are actually from, you know, from people who were children and cults, because yeah. that's... It's where it's, cause it's so obvious, you know. It's, you, could, you could also argue... 
I mean, it's one thing, you know, having compassion and understanding why why adults um, ended up in a in a cut group, what happened to them there. But with a child, it is just so so blatantly obvious that they had not choice. You know, they did not choose this. They 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 did not follow the leader. That's what their parents choose, and they had to bear the brunt of. You know, they they suffer from often really significant damage, and I have so much respect for you know these the second generation. Mm -hmm. Um, and also now, you know, we're seeing this whole reckoning as well. Of lots and lots, lots and more people coming, you know, together in groups and forming initiatives and becoming activists who who really begun to unpack what it meant to be a, a cop child. And yeah, I think my books for them as well. Yeah, and I mean, I mean uh, Janja Lalich, um co-wrote uh, Escaping Utopia, which is a very useful book for for anybody who was born into a cult to. Because the experience is very different, you know, having dealt with I don't know, about 600 people in their recovery from groups over the years. The, the difference between somebody who was born into a group and somebody who went into a group is immense because somebody who, who went into a group as an adult, they have something to go back to. But if your childhood was all within, that was what normality was then that's a much longer journey to to find values to determine what is or isn't true in the world and and to bring the locus of control back into yourself so so that you know you're not just bobbing along on on the tide um of, of other we can, people's we can wishes. talk about this we can talk about this a bit also when um when we come to Gloria Vale because mm. that's for me you know where where I found the schism between the or the the difference between the world that they, the, the, the children at Gloria grew up in and the outside world where they find themselves is so huge. And they're like refugees from another country. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Not having, you know, not having the former life or the former self to go back to, but this is, this is your home. This is all, you know, this is your identity. And then that gets shattered in some ways or doesn't work anymore. Poof, I, I, you know, I've, I, comp I compared it in, in, in culture. I said, it's, they reminded me sometimes of, of people who, you know, who, who somehow got over the, the Berlin Wall to to escape from that regime. You know, the same determination that it takes, and the same fear that something could go wrong, and and the unknown, and leaving everything behind that you had and that you loved, but you just can't be, you just can't survive in that system anymore because you know it's wrong and it's killing you and stifling you. That's yeah, that's what it felt like sometimes for me to hear it. Hearing this, these really brave escape stories from. From people who especially left um left Gloria Bell. And that's still going here in New Zealand, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I I did an intervention with a young woman who was from East Germany and she and her mother had escaped. And it was scary seeing that Scientology was now on top of the East German, one of the most repressive regimes that's ever existed. And so when I pointed out to her documents in Scientology about destroying enemies. She just said, "Well, of course, you have to do that." It's, the, Stasi, the Stasi operated, you know, exactly the same way as us. You know, yeah, I'm sure Scientology learned quite a bit from the Stasi. Somewhere. Yeah, so. it, it, that, that, and you have the same roots in the Gestapo and and the uh, the Cheka in in Russia. That these horrific movements, which you can trace all the way back through the Roman Empire, the Sejanus under Tiberius, all of that. So you decided to take a break from from this and have a nice holiday at um, what I think of as Rajneesh World <laughs> in Pune in yeah, India. You gotta laugh. <laughs> you gotta laugh sometimes. Um, I've always been curious about the sannyasins, as they were called mm. in the United, probably still called in Germany, because I, you know, growing up in Cologne, that was the European headquarter of the of the Rajneesh movement. Mm. So he called himself. I mean, the Germans all called him Bhagwan. I think the, in the supreme English one, people, Bhagwan. Oh yeah. So I so use that we, term we in front. I use that term in front of an Orthodox Hindu one day and saw a face drop. He calls himself what? Super God. <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant, but you know, growing up in Germany, we all knew about Bhagwan, and there were the discos, and they were dressed in orange, and there were these kind of cool people, but also a little bit weird. If they all seemed to really vibe off each other, and they were, and they, we liked the discos. They were clean and sparkly, and there was popping music, and so I always the disco. Had a, oh. yeah, 
so, so, you know, just growing up in the 80s in Cologne, in Germany, um, you were just surrounded by the movement, by the, by the Rajneesh movement, or the, you know, the Sanyasins, and so um, came across all this again, then back, then, you know, years, decades later in New Zealand, and by diving, in our, so I'm dipping my toes into, sometimes diving, into the Neo-Tantra world, and seeing you know how much of you know osha popping up here and there whether it's you know on quotes or people who you know who have a nasa name and have clearly been inspired and i was always like oh my god but it's a cult you know how, you know i was always questioning people I, I always took them down a notch when you know people who i thought were doing good things and i respected them and then you know the osha connection was clear i was always rolling my eyes a bit because i grew up you know with a really clear understanding of this is a fascinating one, you know, and um, and uh, yeah. So in 2017, um, actually, my husband and I we renewed our vows, and we thought, oh, we 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 always wanted to go to India, and we thought, you know, let's check this place out because because I'd already heard that it's now become this really fancy meditation resort. So I I already went there very, you know, with a quite amount of, of skepticism, but also, you know, the workshop junkie that I was at the time was like, oh, here's a new thing. Let's try that out. Sure. I want to see what they have to offer. So very typical for me at the time, I was wearing a journalist hat because I also wrote a, a piece about it. Um, but I was also um, curious sort of for my own healing, seeking, whatever. And it was just a, a great, maybe a great way to spend the first week in India before we, you know, we'd carry on and yeah, I, I came back feeling, you know, like this is not my place, these are not my people. It's funny how they always claim that they're the anti cult I actually spoke to um, one of the head honchos there, um, Raj. Um, yeah, so that's that's another little piece of my book. But then through that, um, a bit later, um, you know, Osho, my Osho, my little excursion into, into the Osho world is really just the door open actually for the much more, at least for me at the time, much more sinister word of Agama Yoga, which is a, a tantric cult on um, Kopangan, recently been dubbed Tantra Island by through with a, an advice documentary. It's a yoga school. It's one of the biggest which yoga. Which is in Thailand, yes. In Thailand, yeah, oh. on this little sort of hippie spiritual island, Kopangan. Um, and I knew that some people in the, you know, in the in the groups that I was interested in here in in New Zealand, um, like it's that they'd gone through karma. So I kind of knew about them that it's quite a hardcore, very strict training, sort of really next level. You come out, you know, as this sort of tantric yoga warrior. Could I, perhaps could I perhaps interject something because one or two of my viewers yeah. may have no idea what tantra is. And um, it, and I'm, it, I, I might not be the the right person to explain well, this. I, I I I might be the right person. Okay, because, but let's let's differentiate. Let, let, let me here. let me yeah. give people mm -hmm. some understanding. There is a tradition arising in about the sixth century AD, um, in both Hinduism and Buddhism, where you have the idea that enlightenment can be gained through very rapidly through sexual contact. This it runs throughout the Tibetan sects. You'll find it here, there, and everywhere. Um, Naropa University, the Western Buddhist University in Boulder, Colorado, had quite a scandal going on when Chogyang Trungpa, its intellectual leader, was discovered to be basically having sex with students, and this was a normal thing. And the idea is that you are teaching somebody how to overcome desire through sex. Now, that's where it begins, and I think it's hokum from beginning to end. In Hinduism, it, it revolves around Kali, the destroyer goddess, who, of course, was the, the goddess worshipped by the Thuggies in India. Um, during the 1840s, the Thuggies were, were extirpated, stopped, because this was a sect, a cult, that were killing four to 5,000 people a year they were accosting strangers on the road and strangling them um, to take all of their goods. They believed themselves to be worshippers of Kali. So they're on the other side of, of this Tantra, that there's the sex side and there's the murder side of, of Tantra. So I have a fairly negative view of the origins of Tantra. What happened in the 20th century with, you know, as Madame Blavatsky and various other people 
brought their half digested ideas of Eastern spirituality into the world, into the Western world, was that people like Alistair Crowley became interested in the idea that you could achieve personal power through sexual rituals. And you could sex magic. That's what he yeah. called it. Sex magic. That's yeah. exactly mm -hmm. what he called it. And he couldn't spell the word magic. He put a K on the end of it. Um, his group has many derivatives, one of them being Scientology, of course, which doesn't practice sex magic, but was run by somebody who did, um, Ron Hubbard, um, which I've documented in laborious detail elsewhere. But what happened was this idea of the human potential movement of sexual fulfillment, uh, Maslow's self-actualization, pulled together in this, this idea, and we got really people who who never really studied Tantra, Rajneesh most certainly never studied Tantra, um, who then put forward these ideas, as Blavatsky did, as if they, they knew everything that they were talking about. And we get this hodgepodge of groups, Agama being, you know, one of the the recent ones so there's your segue go with it again <laughs> back in right I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't have been able to explain that well um but you're already differentiating between what's now called neo tantra and tantra oh. actually a lot of tantra is technically neo tantra oh. and it's, it has a lot of cultural appropriation there as well um so agama's background is is quite interesting as well because there is a really sinister um group behind it. I've got to be careful what I say here because as far as I know they're quite litigious and that is MISA. Um, what does that stand for again? Um, oh god, look it <laughs> up. MISA is a big, big, big warning here because they run under the umbrella of the Atman Foundation. They run um, yoga slash tantra schools across Europe like Nata Yoga in um, Scandinavia, Tara Yoga in the UK and a few other names, Resonance in the Czech Republic and so on. And, um, okay, how do I put this carefully? <laughs> they are still going. They are, Their guru is, um, is on the wanted list of Interpol for um he's been in jail um there are sex trafficking zero sex trafficking allegations against him there's plenty of material out there and the guru of agama is a romanian disciple of this very seedy misa guru who then branched off and started his own school in um, thailand after he had a bit of a bad run with it in india um, so that's the backdrop to Agama, and I think it's quite important, yeah, that they are not steeped in, you know, in the traditions that you you just described. Um, but they they're actually they're they're coming from a, an esoteric yoga sex cult in Romania, where where women have been pushed into sex work and um, porn, um, and they're. I, I don't want to even go into all the details, but hopefully we'll, we'll see more exposure about MISA soon. Mm -hmm. But that's the backdrop to Agama, just, just to give it that reference point. So you had a lot of Romanian influence there, lots of people from Romania who've also come from MISA. That was their guru. Um, calls himself, his real name is Master Stakau, and he calls himself Swami, you know, another holy type of Vivekananda. I think Narcissus is, is quite uh, accurate yeah, on his right. name, personally. But... <laughs> the chances. <laughs> So um, I'm sure, you know, you would know B. Scorpion, who is a gonzo um, cult journalist, who's, yeah. and she's been looking more and more into the um, neo-tantra world as well. And then in 2018, a group of, so uh, just a backtrack. So Agama has had a few attempts from people from, to change it from the inside. So they've, they've had scandals, money scandals. Um, abuse allegations again and again over the years. And at some point, people there had enough because like a center point, there were a lot of good, decent people in there who were who were fond of the school and what they've learned there and how it changed their life and the rigid yoga training had helped them in some ways and it was their community, it had become their job and their life and they'd moved mm -hmm. to the island and been teaching there for 10 years. So they didn't just want to throw all this away, but they definitely wanted the abuse to stop. And so there have been attempts again and again of um, people, men and women, to change the school from within, to, 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 to bring this to the leader, and they were all dismissed, and they were all gaslit, and they were all sent away. So they were, they were dealing with, you know, with this, with this yeah, very narcissistic um, leader who, had, had, who didn't even attempt to look as if 
you know, they were really changing things. Well, there were a few, maybe sort of a few cosmetic changes. Very, I, I see the same patterns now. Since I've studied them a bit with Agama and researched them, I can, I, it's almost like it's a blueprint for how people change, try and change a group from within and they fail and, and, the, and the system just, yeah, gets up held. So in 2018, um, a group of you know people then just had enough and there were reports and they had been collected already just you know, to, to internally create a change and then these reports 31 of them were leaked to be Schofield and um, she did a great job um, blowing a gamma out of the mm -hmm. water as this as a sex card and then the Guardian and I mean and I you know got wind of that and um, I was actually the only reporter there on the ground afterwards after after the B Schofield story, uh, story came out and visited Copenhagen and also did a, f a free yoga class at Agama to go inside I didn't give them any more money and a um, bhajan a, a kid had you know, like a, a singing chanting session I also went there for one night and spend a week on Copenhagen and the Guardian also um, did a big expose and a few more follow-ups. The Swami, um, Narcissus Tagore, had by then fled the island and was in hiding, was on the run, but was still having I mean, like, a bit of, like a bit of a shadow government there at the mm -hmm. school. And um, surprise, surprise, he came back, business as usual. Um, the school put out a newsletter where they basically blamed the victims and pretended nothing bad had happened. The big problem there was that they've chosen, you know, they've chosen that country well because Thailand has a three months had back then had a three month statute of limitation for rape allegations. Three months is nothing, especially if you come out of a cult, which can which can take a lot longer than three months to actually get out and realize what had happened and that that was abusive. And for you know for sexual abuse victims to come forward, it takes quite a while. And then especially if you're in a country where maybe you don't have a work visa, where you're from in another country, where you're from the States or from Europe or so, where the local police might be corrupt or is possibly being paid off by the school, you know, to keep everything on the down low. So finally, two rape um, complaints were filed, one from um, Melbourne um, by a UK citizen and um, at the embassy there, at the, at, the, at the Thai embassy in Melbourne, and one actually by a survivor from Australia who came back to Kampangan and filed a complaint there, but it was too late. So mm -hmm. three months had passed, Swami came back, oh, Narcissus Taco, sorry, I shouldn't really use the holy <laughs> name, not even the facetious way. Um, I don't yeah. tend to call Mahesh Maharishi, but I've not met anybody else who doesn't. You know, great teacher. Who gave you that title? I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Swami. Yeah, really. I mean, he, he got it in, in India, apparently, through lineage. Yeah. But oh. it just, you know, anyone who who's, who sits in his position and hasn't acknowledged the fact that he's an alleged sexual abuser and there is really good evidence for that hmm. and and still stars himself as it, it's just it's just so appalling so long story short Agama is still going I'm actually going back there this year not to Agama but to Kopangan it's just across the road from Agama I'm going to hold a book event so um, there's some really good people on Agama um, who want to keep Agama safe there's an organization called Safe Pangan there is a, a writer's group and they've invited me to come to their write night and there's you know, Hemingway's restaurant. There's some, a lot of people who've definitely had a guts full of Agama and they're really happy to see me return oh. to the scene of the crime and hold a book of in there, which is quite edgy for me to do that, but I will. Yeah. So do you want me to actually read a little bit um, about Agama? I do Agama? want you to actually yeah. read a little bit. Yeah. It's so great that you, you're letting me read. It's just really nice to be able to give a, give a taste of my book. And um so I found a few Kiwis also who've been through Agama. Mm. Lots and lots of Australians were in there, especially from Melbourne and then from, you know, everywhere, Canada, the UK, um, UK, America, you name it. It was a very international school with thousands of students. So one of them, I just read, should I read two pieces or just one? Two pieces is good. We prefer two. Two pieces is good. Okay. So one is Tina from Auckland. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I read you uh, what was typical for what happened to a lot of women there. In 2008, Swami invited Tina to his house for one-on-one -on -one healing meditation in his office, 
which was next to his bedroom. When their silent sitting and breathing was done and she was still in an altered state, the heavy man, then in his 50s, moved over on the sofa and started kissing her and taking her clothes off without asking. She firmly said no, but he kept pushing her to sleep with him. Disgusted, she refused. What disturbed her even more was the senior teacher's reaction afterwards. He seemed amused and asked her, oh, wow, how did you manage to leave without making love? That never happens. Hina was angry about Swami's transgression and embarrassed that she almost fell for it. Too naive to realize that meditate meant having sex. But she tried to hide it all and push it down. What had happened at Swami's house was only her problem that she needed to overcome. If Tina and others tried to mention unwanted sexual advances to the school management, they were told that they needed to be more open in their heart chakra. It was the student's karma to work through it, especially if something happened more than once. The tipping point for Tina came when she was upset about two male teachers who had lied to her. So she complained to a senior teacher. Instead of admonishing the men, the teacher told Tina it was all her fault. She had attracted that dishonesty because of the negative energy she was putting out. Thinking about it all sticks, still makes her so uncomfortable that she struggles to find words. Down the phone line, I can feel how hard it is for her to drag it up again, even years later. She doesn't want to be seen as the victim because it feels weak, weak like being humiliated again. So that touches a bit on the whole culture of victim shaming, victim blaming, mm. spiritual bypassing, which is so toxic, which I've seen, you know, it's rife in the in the New Age world and all cultic groups, but especially when it, it comes in this disguise of, of, of spirituality that it's actually good for your growth if you don't complain, if you don't feel the pain, if you if you push it away, if you if you forgive, you know, if you forgive the abuser, then you're actually a more enlightened being. And so I mean, another yeah let, let, let say victim yeah. blaming is, is a is a standard marker for an authoritarian cult um you know like shunning that that a group tells you you can't talk to people you you're into a, a zone and it and the standard form is that anything good that happens to you is because of the group it's nothing to do with your intelligence or your hard work it's because of the the teacher and the group and anything that bad that happens to you is your fault anything bad that happens to the leader is also your fault you know the the right. and it and it's it always works <laughs> At its extreme, this version of Karma Vipaka, which is yeah. lifted out of Buddhist and Indian ideas, becomes Poa, which was the doctrine that Osahara used in Om Shinrikyo to say we need to kill the whole population of Japan. And they had enough sarin gas to kill four million by the time they were caught. And Poa is a doctrine that says that you accelerate karma. You do horrific things to people. So they will overcome their karma. So you, we come into this bizarre through the looking glass world where, yeah, what happens to you is it's spiritual growth for you to feel pain. It's spiritual growth for you to be terrified. It's spiritual growth for you to be subservient. And if you're sufficiently yeah. subservient, you will be able to come into control of yourself, you know, you will become self-determined if you do exactly what you're told. And it's a it's psychic slavery. Not, you know, whichever way we look at it, it's a way of enslaving people, bullying them and pushing them down. And particularly in the neo-tantra world, this seems to be very misogynistic. There seems to be a horrific, you know, masculine, masculine toxicity here that is about um bullying sabotaging and undermining women absolutely and then especially around sexuality because that is a big part of you know part of what happens in, in neo tantra mm -hmm. and um you know you mentioned orgies before in most groups they're never called orgies they're called temple nights or you know and i think it'd be great if people just name it for what it is and then people can make a more participants can make a more informed choice it's not sold to them as oh this this will this will help and heal you and help you overcome your hang-ups and at the gamma also um you know there's a woman a woman went into psychosis after being coerced pushed um into group sex mm. so it, this this is it's not just about someone maybe ab abusing you in that space i mean 
that can happen, you know, outside of a of a cult and any, you know, sort of sexual interaction. But of course, it's always more. It gets more tricky if some people hold the power or the ones that are the teachers or seem to know better than others. But it's but but what what can also happen is is re-traumatization or people who are just too much in, in the overwhelm or something gets triggered because don't forget a lot of people came to Ugama also find themselves in the neo tantra world because they're there because they have some kind of sexual trauma and they want to heal that and maybe therapy or whatever they've tried before hasn't hasn't really helped them enough or they they, they think there's a, there must be a different way and this is the way to do it it's kind of it's often sold to them in that way as well. So let me read you um, um, what happened to, to Sadana. She was a, that's not her real name, but it's the one she chose for my book. And yeah, she was one of those people who were actually, she did not want to open a relationship. She wasn't polyamorous. Her boyfriend, her boyfriend was really, really pushy that this is, if she wants to advance in her spiritual growth, that's, she needs to be more open. Yeah? She needs to be with other men and not just with him. So he was actually the driving force in some ways. So it was all pretty, pretty messed up. And yeah. she went on this um, long course where at the end, um, the final ritual, the final ritual was, was, was group sex. The ritual started with the usual ingredients to make it spiritual. Soft music, a heart opening meditation, eye gazing. Then foreplay until the music changed and the facilitator announced that now was the time to have intercourse. Sadana dissociated while she tried to engage with men, her mind detached from her body. When it was all over, she stayed on for another hour, still having penetrative sex like a puppet. Whatever they told her she was meant to get from this, she didn't. She had betrayed herself and the others had too. She felt they had pushed her to do this. The senior teacher even said, well done at the final ceremony when they were given a certificate. But her heart didn't crack open like she had been promised. She hadn't entered a new paradigm of love and light. Instead, she felt broken and dirty and left alone to deal with it all. Yeah, so that's kind of, it's kind of a typical thing, you know, where you don't even have someone who is a sexual abuse. And now this, this, that's exactly the stuff where you can't go to the police for that. You can't, you can't go, especially not to the Thai police and say, I agreed to be in a group sex situation um, and I feel manipulated and I'm, and I'm broken and I'm having big issues from that and it feels like it wasn't right. You know, they, you can't lay criminal charges against it and still there's clearly something wrong there in the whole dynamics. Hmm. And, and of course you can always, you know, you can argue how much does someone have agency? Could she have seen us coming? But then don't forget, a lot of these things are super secretive, especially at a gamma. Oh, and yeah. I also know this from the courses I've done, like with Esther, a lot of stuff is really secretive. They don't tell you beforehand what you're going to do because then the mystery is gone. You know, the mystery of the mystery school is gone. So, so often, you know, it's it's all part of oh, you're going to learn when you when you get there, and then you you're already on the, in you know, in the whole Algat dynamic where where your system is flooded with new transmitters or you're on the workshop high, you want to get with the program, you've already invested so many days or weeks or dollars into this that you're, you're probably more motivated just by all that to just get with it and, and do what the others are doing and get your money's worth and maybe get the break the breakthrough through the breakdown or whatever. You, you, you might, plus it's, it would be very hard, I think, to imagine that you step away from this and go, mm, actually, I'm going to spend a day just thinking about whether I want to be part of this ritual or not. And because people will have expectations on you. And, you know, like Sadana here has been told this will be amazing and she would finally be a free woman and more spiritual and more connected and all of this so it's 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 those kind of kind of dynamics that are often hard to describe on on the outside when people think of sexual abuse they they don't really see that there is such a big gray area mm. where you slide into a dynamic that you then it's really hard to to stop that and i find it especially toxic when they have consent courses now also at Agama and and the school that I've been you know in for a long time is the International School of Temple Arts they they offer you the wheel of consent in the beginning which was actually a great modality I really I really I really appreciate and read the wheel of consent and they give you the, they do that on the first day of an Esther course train of an Esther training 
so you learn how to say your yes and your no. But do, can you really learn that in the course of one day after after having been you know conditioned all your life maybe to be a people pleaser and as a woman especially to mm. smile and be you know it's hard to say no and and, and once you and then the, then the course gets really intense and you you get into these really quite you know really big rituals and 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 as you're constantly in this maelstrom and this cauldron of intensity and sharing circles and scream therapy and whatnot. How how do you actually have the capacity to really listen to your body and really really feel what your nervous system where you're at? Yeah, even if, if theoretically you could say, oh yeah, yes, yes, but maybe your body speaks another language. But how can you actually listen to that? So it always becomes a bit of a fig leaf for me these days if people say, oh yeah, we have we have we're doing consent work and then we push you, we we take you down that other road. Does that really go together? You know, does one really inform the other? Um, I have my doubts sometimes. I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, the last 40 years of, of my life have been about how people are unduly influenced, how exploitative persuasion works, and how even the brightest and most highly educated of people are completely vulnerable and susceptible. Um, in 2015, in our um, Criminal Justice Act, in, in the UK, we incorporated coercive control as a notion. And even the wording there, the use of the word coercion, which means forceful, is not accurate, that people can be gaslit, they can be uh, triangulated, where they're set against somebody who would be able to help them. So they're removed from, from that protection. And understanding, you, you know, for me, the the thing I've been working, meant to be working on for the last year is a curriculum for schools. And um, I keep being distracted. But it it seems so easy that to get somebody to recover from an experience like this, you're often dealing with about 10 years. You're dealing with quite a long period of trauma and, and upset. To teach somebody how to spot this takes a couple of days you can see that the 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 selling techniques that are used by these groups to get your consent to manipulate consent to manufacture consent these are things that, that we should be more aware of and we're in a society you know we're starting to wake up a little bit to to the idea of cults but even there if you look at something like wild wild country which was tremendously popular it didn't tell you anything about the Rajneesh organization and what people did. Right. It was just yeah. senior members talking about whether they did or didn't feel good about it. They didn't tell you about the 19 hour work days building, you know, Rajneesh Puram at the Big Muddy in Oregon. So, and I think we, we all have this problem of, of exactly what you were saying before. Uh, I would probably, I wouldn't have done that, you know, if they'd come hammering on my door and told me to, to kill my, Jewish neighbor. I wouldn't have done that. I'd never have done that. And I ran into this because I was asked to join Ron Hubbard's personal staff in 1977. And it was called Going Over the Rainbow, that you would go and you would work directly with Ron Hubbard, who was in hiding and nobody had seen him for a couple of years. And I said, all right, yes, sir, I'll come and do that for a year. He had a music project. I'd play the drums. I'll come and play the drums for Ron Hubbard. That would be quite interesting meeting this man. And then they, they said, great. And then he came back and they said, ah, one year won't be enough. You have to sign a contract for a thousand million years. And um, I, I just went, well, you can have me for a year, but that's a lot. Later on in 1983, at 84, I was reading transcripts of testimony by people who went over the rainbow. And there were quite a lot, a few hundred. And the horrific treatment they received, you know, if they got sick, they were at a temperature of, of more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so in the 40s centigrade, in the desert at La Quinta uh, in California. And if they get sick, they're put into this little um, kind of cell where anybody who's sick is put. So you're at a temperature outside of more than 100 degrees. You're now inside this little place where you can pick up the infections of anybody else. They were, they were working as slaves that, you know, 
that I found out that, that Hubbard screamed his head off at people. I interviewed so many people. And he would just come within two inches of some somebody. His teeth were, were all falling out because they'd rotted. So he stank. And he'd scream his head off at them about how they were trying to destroy humanity by not having his cigarette lit on time or, or whatever it was he was abusing them for. And it, this was really not the idea I had of the great leader of Scientology um, when I was a member. But the question when I read that testimony was, would I have cracked? Would I have gone under? I didn't go, oh, that could never have happened to me. I'm far too intelligent for that to happen to me. Um, understanding that the group dynamics, the, the group think, the, the compliance that's normal, the people pleasing, the wanting to belong, that, and the increments of dissonance stage by stage by stage where you accept some small idea, for example, that L. Ron Hubbard's retinue wore sailor suits, which I always found a little bit strange, I must say. But OK, you accept that, that you're going to be charged £200 an hour for, for counselling. All right, OK, you know, you accept these things bit by bit. And then one day you find that you are the other side of the looking glass. You've now become the perpetrator. You've now become the person who is doing this to others. Um, I, I interviewed a, a German uh, called Dieter Roman who is a, a wonderful man, a psychologist. And we met him, oh, about 30 years ago, and he'd been in the Children of God briefly. And he spent six months convincing young women to go out and act as prostitutes to recruit into the group. And he'd, he'd paid everything back, I think, by then. He'd gone and become a psychologist and he'd helped lots of people by then, and I'm sure you know thousands more by now. But to see him as he talked about it and the incomprehension that was still there, how did I ever do this thing? And understanding that for any of us, the, the only people who are not influenced by others are psychopaths. All of the rest of us are influenceable. Uh, if you have any care, any compassion, any humanity, then you can be manipulated. And it's, nothing is taught about it in our schools. Nothing at all is taught. Um, we and the schools themselves tend to be authoritarian and pass on this idea of obedience, which is you know, why I advocate my friend Ari Chalef's intelligent disobedience, you know, as a necessity in child rearing. That that we we have to change that if if we're to change society and and grow up as human beings. I tend to think that as a species we're we're really not very adult as yet in our appreciation of of the world. So, more. yeah. Um, would, do you have more that you'd like to add about Agama at this point, or shall we move on to Gloria Vale? I think let's move on to Gloria Vale because it's it's such a different looking cult to Centre mm. Point and to Agama, mm. and um, I was never as passionate about researching them. So Gloria Vale is a fundamentalist Christian community mm. here in the actually almost the Christian community here in, on the west coast in New Zealand. So even for New Zealand standards, very remote in the bush. 40 minutes drive from the next tiny little, little township. Um, there were the, the Cooperites um, in the late 70s, 80s, um, and then finally moved to this piece of land called Gloryville. And um, their founder, a late founder, Neville Cooper, called himself Hopeful Christian, was a traveling preacher from Australia with some miracle survivor story of a plane crash and so on. Um, found his flock here in New Zealand um, and then began to isolate them more and more. And they all, when I started putting on the blue uniforms, moved into those blue uniforms, long dresses, sort of Victorian looking dresses for the women, um, blue girl for the men as well. Very paced appearance on, on the outside. Um, no possessions, communal living, the families live in big hostels together, or every family, you know, many families on one floor, each family in one room with their 10 to 15 children or so. Only one separate. room with their 10 to 15 children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One room, yeah, yeah, lots of beds and curtains and very little possessions apart from, you know, a change of your uniform pretty much. Um, and teenagers get uh, made off as soon, you know, as soon as that's legal possible. Arranged marriages. There's a big focus on the wedding night, that gets almost sort of publicly celebrated until the couple's taken away through the special 
bedroom where the late leader, hopeful Christian, used to interfere quite a bit and check on the couple. They were doing everything right or handing some, you know, yeah. You know, I mean, this 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 is the thing. This is why Gloriavel is in my book, not just because it's in New Zealand, because it totally fits my definition of a quote unquote sex cult. Because there's always been from the early days, there's been a real focus on on sexuality, not that different to, to center point, even though center point was all about sleep with as many different people as you can and open up your relationships and don't be you know too attached to one person. And at, at, at Gloriavel, it's it's very strict um, monogamy, you know, there is no divorce. You, you know, you there is you know they you, you, you'd go to hell if you had an affair or if you weren't faithful. But within the marriage, it's all about um, being sexually available, the women to the men. It's a very patriarchal, very misogynistic system. It's even in their scriptures, in their little booklet, what we believe is that, you know, thou shalt not deny the spouse and body, so to speak. And um, this is, and, and it, it comes out in so many ways, blatantly sideways, um, the you know, the former leader who's, who, who died a few years ago, Hopper Christian, he gave marriage, I mean, I'm putting, you know, air quotes here, marriage advice to young couples, and it actually ended up being sexual abuse to one young woman who was still a virgin at the time, and he penetrated her with a with a wooden dildo and basically raped her, and he went to jail later for this and other offences. He was, a, you know, like reporter, he was a sexual predator, who, and he, he'd gone to jail while he was still the leader of his community. But if, you know his flock always believed he had been spreading the gospel, and this is why he's been persecuted. So they were and are still very, very isolated. Also, in terms of the information that they're getting, I mean, some people in there now know how to get on the internet. So things have mm -hmm. things have quite drastically changed in the last few years because there's a group um, that's formed um, a support group that's formed from a Baptist church um, here in New Zealand, and it's called the Gloria Valiva Support Trust. And they've actually, they're actually doing really, really amazing and really well-informed work to help leavers and also to bring the cup down. There are now a number of court cases here in New Zealand. So finally, Gloria Valiva has come on the radar. But when I started investigating it, um, I mean, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't so close to home. With Center Point and in Agama, I, I was so well. Maybe I, I could have been one of these people in in there because they offer some things that spoke to me. Yeah. With this this radicalized, you know, or this super fundamentalist Christianity, nothing spoke to me. I mean, I, I get where they live. It's a beautiful place and the communal living and being very productive and living off the land and all. Yeah, all that, you know, is it's 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 that's you could see that as a positive. But apart from that, you know, I just. Uh, it had no, no appeal to me. So maybe it didn't cut so deep as first, mm. you know, also, but then I met leavers and especially the women who've come out of there and the girls, you know, the former girls who've come out um, and what they had to cut to overcome and their plight and they've been raised. I could just, I could just read this little passage to you. Sure. Um, just the way that they've been, they've been raised there. So that was that's actually that's Theo who is um who was in her early twenties when I met her. And she was basically kicked out overnight, like so many of them, you know, it was nothing. And just put on a bus. She'd never been on a on a plane. She had to fly up to Auckland where there was a relative who she we'd not re never really met before. She was completely thrown as an eighty year old into this new life, like a refugee from another country, yeah. from another planet. Yeah. She told me that most girls who come out of the cult have nothing to say and don't look you in the eye. Used to being over-criticized, neither believing in themselves nor thinking for themselves, but only doing what they're told. They are raised to be meek and submissive, not interested in anything else besides bearing children. Some who have only been defined by being objects for men now act that out overtly in their new dress and behavior. The loss of self is so huge that most don't even know what their favorite color is. So another woman I met was um, Virginia. So, like I said before, it didn't glory. Even though I was I was moved by you know by these stories, but I was more just in my journalistic world, then, where you know a center point, you know, you know, I, I came I came to close, and um, then I met Virginia Courage, and she really deserves her last name, um, who is now has now laid charges against her own sexual abuser from from center point, sorry from Gloria Vale. And um, I met her towards the end of my research. Um, 
Well, I thought, you know, I, I really understand Gloria Val and what I didn't understand how much it actually resembles Gilead from the Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. The star of whom, of course, is a Scientologist. I know, the, the irony, right? And um, the costumes from The Handmaid's Tale were actually modeled on Gloria Val from New Zealand. Oh. I kid you not. So, um, very fitting. And I, I won't spare you all the descriptions of, of sexual abuse um, that, you know, what happened to Virginia, but I'll, I'll just give you, I'll give you something. And it really had an effect on me as well, hearing all this. Despite the toll it takes on their bodies, Gloria women gain an unspoken status by having as many children as possible. Ten or more is the 